Welcome to Epos against this game. All right, so what is it y'all are looking at? So we have victory tra point track around the half the outside. So mm -hmm. it goes up to 49. Uh, you're going to go through it at least once, maybe twice. We'll see how it goes. Up here in the uh, top left-hand corner, and you know what? Hold on. I need to bring something up a moment. You need to go there. Sorry about this. Mm. There we go. All right. So it's a civilization game in a sense that we are all various civilizations. We are going to be acquiring these cards, which are developments or they are um, uh, civilization cards in that, you know, uh, it has a stable, a tenement, a well, a statue, etc. Uh, for the various areas out here. Out here on the map, we have the map broken up into three different regions. There's fuchsia, purple, whatnot. There is a blue region and a yellow or African region, if you will. You'll also notice this dark circle around here, which uh, surrounds the various poleus, I think is that? Polis, plural for that, poleus, I think. Each of these are uh, potential cities. We have six city buildings that we're going to be placing out, out there, as well as pioneers. Pioneers are uh, the building blocks for cities out here into the various polis. So the pol a polis is adjacent to three other polis, <laughs> three other city spots within uh, the big area. And then there are provinces. Once you have a city built within somewhere inside this center city or this center area, you then can build cities out here into the province areas. Also notice that there are a couple of provinces. There is one up here in this corner and there is one over on this side that has two different colors. When you build, you build either in one of the two colors. So there are... How many are there? There's eight? Nine, eight? Nine total cities. Nine city areas within each region. Region. There you go. That's it. So that's the map out here. Each city also has a certain type of city, whether it's a oracle, a... Temple. Temple. Uh, thank you. Or... That thing is trade. Trading. Trade. We're going to call them bags, eyeballs in temples mm. or, or, or buildings, whatnot, out here. Those are the three different main types of uh, cities that they can be. We have a turn track down here in the bottom. The game takes place over three epochs or three eras, broken down into two rounds each. Three epochs, two rounds, which makes six rounds. We have the, bill, uh, the card display down here, which will cycle through. We have the purchase amounts for the cards down here. And then we have the main actions. The main actions have to do with the tiles up here in the top left corner, which are called training markers or training tiles, has to do with the training action, which are going to be these green uh, action tiles. Now, our scenario tonight is actually on the other side of the board. So all of these spaces out here will actually have these tiles out there. But because we have to flip the board before we actually start playing, we didn't bother putting the tiles back out there yep. because they're printed on the board anyways and you'll you all be able to see them. But as it is, there will be tiles out here in all of these various action spaces as well. So there are various actions that we can take. We have uh, bonus markers that are milestones that when you reach, uh, if you were the first to reach one of those milestones, you get the higher value, otherwise you get the uh, supplemental or the secondary uh, milestone marker, which is worth half as many points. And then everybody has their own player boards as well. Their player boards consist of a number of different things. We have our time track up here at the top. And these are dual layer in a sense that they're not uh, stickered down, but it, they work as dual layer boards. Mm -hmm. So we have the time track up here as well as five blocking spaces at the beginning of the game. Then we have the six different types of inhabitants of our civilization, which 
these are nobles, that's army, that's religion, this is, I think, senators, uh, this is craftsmen, and that Merchant, one's merchants. merchants. However, <laughs> we have our own, we've been playing this a lot lately, we have our own names for them, but those are what those are. Uh, we are going to be advancing these as they get trained up here, and as they move to the right or left, respectively, that's how many steps they've moved, depending <coughs> on whether or not they move from the left or from the right. We have a simple little player aid that shows the two phases of each turn. We have the flourish phase as well as the reform, reform phase over here. Then we also have the two different uh, types of or cubes that we're going to be able to acquire. Oracle cubes or temple cubes, which will be little rule breakers for each of us. In addition to that, we have time markers, which are single hourglasses and double hourglasses on the other side, and then markers, which are going to, wherever they are, dictate what they are, and we'll talk about that more here in a little bit. Again, there is a turn marker here and then all the tiles, but again, we're going to flip the board over uh, to teach the other side. So that's everything you're looking at, as well as the display of cards, and then there is uh, two other decks of cards. They are for Epoch 2 and Epoch 3 when we get into them. All right, so that's everything you're looking at. How is it you actually play the game? Well, as I mentioned, the game takes place over three epochs. Within each epoch, there are two rounds. Within each of those rounds, there are two phases. There is effectively a take actions phase and then a reset but get income phase as well. All right, so... Uh, a flourish phase and a reform phase. So if you take a look again at my player board over here, on our turn during the flourish phase, you're going to take an action. Very simple. Uh, so what actions are available to you? There are a total of six different actions that you can take. They are training. There is take the first player marker. There is tax collector. a tax collector here. There is building. Building is actually uh, building the cards that you have in your hand. Mm -hmm. Then there is architect. architect, which is acquiring these cards. And finally, there is navigator, which is going to be building out here on the board. And obviously, I'm going to go through all of these things uh, individually. So let's go ahead and start with... The cards, because the cards kind of drive the action for most of the other things in this game. So if you take a look, these are the available actions. Each of these actions have a, and again, the tiles look identical to them. They just, these are holding spots for them. On the, based on the player count, however many are out there, pretty straightforward on that. Otherwise, there is a monetary value, meaning that is the amount of money that you must pay to take the action. In addition to that, there is a time requirement. So each of these tiles, when you take one of those tiles, whichever, whatever the tile is, and again, I'm just gonna use this in, as an example. If I'm taking that tile, it shows that it also requires you to take one time tile. Now there are some that require you to take two time tiles. If you take two time or when you do so, you have an option, either you take a single tile with two hourglasses on it, which means it's going to hang around for two rounds, or you could choose not to and get less actions now, but both of these will come, will clear during the reform phase, all right? So you pay the amount of money and you take whatever the amount of time is shown, unless it shows two, then you choose how that's going to be. Now, when you do these actions, again, if you take a look over here on my player board, so here, you take the tile, you pay the amount of cash, and then you place your time markers on your board, whether it's one or two or whatnot. The amount of spaces are going to influence the amount of actions you're going to be able to take. So we are going to have asymmetric both action number of actions uh, as well as what actions we're going to take throughout a given round. So that's the mechanism of how that works. But now let's talk about the, the uh, individual actions themselves. So the individual action is what's shown there. And again, that one is 
Architect. Okay. So, Architect, you know it. It has the little compass on it. Uh, so, six, six, eight, eight, and ten dollars, respectively, as well as one or two time. Now, when you take that action, you're going to notice down here at the bottom of the card display, and I just realized I don't have one of those, so it's all right. We're going to move this over like so. The left part of the card display has some number over here of both amount of cards as well as amount of money spent. So what you're looking at is, depending on which tile that you actually take. So for instance, if somebody took that eight, what that means is you spend the full amount and then it is based on what tile you took, how many cards you can take and where the location of those cards are. So what I mean by that is if I want to take all or three of these cards, I have to have spent at least $8 and I can take any three of those. Or I could maybe choose a $6 tile and then choose two of any of those two cards, or I could choose and take all three of those, et cetera, et cetera. I think you guys get the idea on how that works. So that is the left half and the right half over here, you'll notice $10 allows you to draw up to that, uh, three of them or two of them, the whole kit and caboodle is your option at that point. When we get into uh, Epoch 2 and 3, all during the reset, all of the current Epoch cards go away and they form a discard pile. So if you've spent at least $8, you can then go digging for cards in the discard pile. If you spent eight if you spent, uh, sorry, eight or more, you can take two cards from the discard pile or two, one from here, one from the discard, or two from here, etc. If you spend $6, you can get one from the discard or one from there onto the left. You get the idea on how that works. All right, so you take some amount of cards. Your hand limit is not checked until the uh, end of the round, i.e. during the reform phase of that round. So you, there is no hand limit size during a round. But once we get to the reform phase, there will be penalties for anybody that has more than three cards left in their hand. There is no mechanism in this game to get rid of cards. At the end of the game, you're either going to score positively or negatively for those cards if you have them left over, if you haven't built them. So if you buy them, you probably ought to be able to build them or at least figure out a way to do that. So with that said, now let's take a look at the actual cards themselves. These are Epoch 1 cards. They are going to look a lot like Epoch 2 cards, but the Epoch 3 cards are going to look a little bit different. They're going to be worth more points. And also you'll notice that this little area of the board is, or of the card is not going to have these little icons on them. Whereas Epoch 1 and 2 do. So let's look at the nomenclature of the cards. First off, uh, these are base game cards. They have the little uh, spear, I guess that is, stone spear in the top left-hand corner. They are from Epoch 1. They have a flavor of what it is. It's a winery. How do we know that? Because dudes are apparently picking grapes. Okay, does that matter? In the theme of things, outside of that, whatnot. Then there are scoring icons over here in the top right-hand corner. Uh, where the icon is dictates what it is. So in urn uh, is always going to be in the second one. A harp, harp, harp is scored, harp, uh, is always going to be at the bottom. A angle is going to be in the third one. You get the idea, helmet in the top one. Then there is a prerequisite of the amount of people or the population, the trained value of the actions in your uh, on your tableau. So you must have at least one noble, you must have at least two merchants, and you must have at least one religion, let's call it. And if you do, then you can play this card to be able to do this stuff, which is the scoring and the, the positive, mostly, mm -hmm. aspect of the card. So that's the nomenclature of the card. I'll get back to that here momentarily. So we've talked about how you acquire cards into your hand. Again, no hand limit until the end, but you want to be at three or less at the end of a round. So from there, then, now that we have cards, how do you play cards? Well, you play cards from these actions right here. The difference between the darkened one 
and the uh, brighter one, this one doesn't get a tile on it. All of these get tiles based on player count. This one's always available. And man, does it hurt to have to take that action. So, you know, but if all of these are gone and you're desperate, you can still take the action, okay? So just like uh, these down here, these have a cost associated, well, sometimes a cost associated with them, a time, and then this is how you build cards. When you build, you're always going to be able to build a single card from your hand. So getting back to this, these prerequisites, how do you get those? Well, I'm glad you asked because before we actually talk about that, doing this out of order, probably ought to talk about the training. So the training, we have the tiles up here that are available. Training tiles have a cost associated in top left hand corner, have a time, and then this says, hey, you can train. The cost to train is shown up there in the left hand corner and I'm gonna let Shrey be Vanna for me for this stuff. If you wish to train a single one of those, let's say you wanna train, I don't know, the craftsman, the workman one. So that one, it, you see that it costs to train a single one is $2. So, or you could spend that $2 to train any of those three. It's from there to the left, just like how the card display was. But if you wanna train the army dude here, uh, it would cost $4. But if you wish to train two, it is that cost, whatever it is, and it must be all two of them to the left of whatever it is. So if you wanna only spend $4, meaning you take that tile, spend $4, you could either train this one twice, this one twice, or one of each, okay? Now, in the base game, what happens then? Let's say I went ahead, I took this tile onto my tableau, and then I said I'm gonna train each of these once. What's going to happen then is these are going to move. They are going to drop out, stay in the same position. Everything's going to slide to the left. So those are, and now they are going to reverse their current order and slide back down. So that's the kind of the market mechanism for training, okay? And when you train, Again, looking over here in my tableau, when you train, so I just trained this one step and I trained, uh, it was this one, one step. You move them over just like that. So now that is one and one. But as these move up, it limits the amount of training you can do on the other side, sort of. They push each other once they've met. So once that is trained all the way up and as far as they go, then at this point, if you wanna train this one, it's going to, you're going to gain one and lose one as it were, and it works. It, that only happens once they've actually met their, their spaces, okay, or their, their opposites. And these are in a very particular uh, order because you'll notice on the actual cards, uh, these are the order in which they are. It just makes it a whole lot easier. So looking at this, to be able to build the winery, I must have one noble, I must have two merchants, and I must have one religion. So in other words, my tableau must look at least like this. So one, two, and one. It could be higher for those, and the other ones, it doesn't matter, so they could be whatever. But once I have qualified, I show my work, I say, hey, I'm gonna play that, okay, cool. I play it into my tableau, here and then I get to actually score it and do all the cool things that are on there. So victory points, you probably guessed that. Okay, so score that amount of victory points. In addition to that, you choose one icon. Doesn't matter. Um, so let's say I have already played all of these cards and this is probably a terrible example, but that's fine. I then say, hey, I'm gonna score urns. I count that urn so that'd be four points and then one for every other card that has an urn on it. But let's say I've already played these and then I just played this one, I would score two points, three, four points in that case, okay? Easy enough. In addition to that, you do the positive and negative things respectively uh, that's shown over there on the cards. So for instance, this is, hey, get a couple of free trainings. So the uh, merchant and the, uh, the craftsman uh, they each advance one, so awesome. One, one, yay, that's awesome, okay. And then basically this card is done except for the bonus scoring for whenever you play other cards. 
This one, score point, but this, oh, that's how you remove these blocking tokens. And removing these, now I have spots for more actions for the, you know, to be able to take in a given round. That is tasty, tasty goodness. This one here, however, says during the reform phase, that's what the little moon symbol shows, you can spend uh, three bucks for a point, do that up to five times. Now, there are other icons like this, when we talk about building out on the on the in the uh, on the map, uh, that'll make more sense. In addition to that, there are some negatives. I actually don't think there are any negatives in the first uh, epoch. I don't think there I are. I thought no. there was, but there's not. Really but there are negatives too. that can come out. But this says, hey, whenever you take the tax collector action, get double. Okay, awesome. And that's just an ongoing thing. The last thing that I will show y'all are these, which these are during your action phase, this is as if you took a tile, when you take a tile, or as if you took a tile, the four... Architect. architect. Thank you. For some reason, it's not sticking in my head. When uh, You can take a four architect action. You do have to take the time, but you do not have to take the architect tile, meaning there is no four architect tile, and that saves you a spot on your time uh Marker. So instead, sweet. just do that, and you get to take that action. But you can only do that once per round. So if you get it out in round one, you could theoretically do that up to six times throughout mm -hmm. the whole game. And you put the little marker on there to show, hey, I've used it this round. Okay. So that's building. Any questions on building? Nope. Okay. Easy enough. All right. That was weird. Okay. So then we have taken the first player marker. Pretty simple. You actually physically, go ahead, put it out there if you want. Uh, you grab it and uh, you act, mm, you take this marker. It goes onto your timeline. And uh, during the reform phase, you're going to take the first player marker and you immediately get two bucks. However, if nobody has taken it on a given round, same thing. You'll take it at the end of the, or during the reform phase. You score a point and you get money based on what round you actually took it in. That's only if nobody took it, yeah. if it remained prior round. in a yeah. prior round. Yeah. So if it's round five and nobody took it in round four, that's worth five bucks, a point, and then you become the first player. All right. So moving on down from there is the tax collector. Tax collector, these don't have tiles. They just straight up say, hey, you can do this anytime. Uh, this says you get four bucks in one time. Okay. This says get eight bucks in two time. Again, it's either a two singles or a double, your choice. All right. So, hey, looky there. I've talked about all of the available actions except for the one that has to do with the map, which arguably is the most confusing, but really it's not confusing. So last action, navigator, it's called. Uh, they are broken down into three distinct areas. The first area is the printed one, which again, oh, that sucks, but desperate times. Uh, and these three, that is one. Then these are a different animal, and these are a different animal. So uh, they're similar, but different. We'll talk about the top ones first. The top ones say, hey, you get to put out pioneers based on the amount that are shown. The pioneers are just the little round discs that show. It's either going to be two or four. You can only put out pioneers where you have presence already, meaning you either have cities already out there. So uh, let's say it is Ken's turn here in this case. By the way, you two need to switch colors, but I digress. Why? Um, it's, it's backwards on there. Anyway, when you place pioneers, depending on which one you take, place two pioneers, place four. Spend the time, spend money, your choice. But when you do so, you place those pioneers anywhere you have presence. Presence is you have pioneers already there or you have already built a city out there. And you can mix and match however you want. You could do something like that if you wanted. You could, that's totally okay. Okay, that is here. Each of these navigation, regardless of which tile you take, has three distinct steps. Step one, placing pioneers out there. Once you've done that, then step two is you may move whatever the number of pioneers you placed, you can move that many, you get that much movement points. Let's put it that way. 
Each adjacent area costs one point. It's very simple. So I could, if I want, move this one, two, three. That's three of my four points. And then I could move four if I want. Or it doesn't have to be the ones you just placed. It could be any of them. So you move up to that amount. It's either going to be two or four movement points out there. The third step is you can found a city if you wish. So founding a city, very simple. It is, it requires a total of six pioneers. So again, it may be on when you would place the four, you place one, two, three, and maybe you placed four like that. At that point, you choose the move or not, whatnot. At that, after that, phase three is for every, if there's a six there, you may place a city. So you take these off, these go back to your supply, and you place a city when you do so. When you place a city, you also get a couple of bonuses. You get whatever is shown on that city that you just founded. And also, you also trigger the other areas that are in that, that region. So what I mean by that is, let's say instead of building down here, maybe he built up here, okay? So this is the new city that Ken just built. You'll notice that here in the fuchsia, pink area, purple, whatnot, he just built this. That means he takes one of those cubes here and then he's going to place it onto the temple track on his board. So that will go there. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. In addition to that, he also triggers other cities in the same region. So he's going to score two points. So he advances his marker two points. Okay, good. And then finally, on places he doesn't have a city, he may trigger that bonus, whatever that is. But by to do so, it requires him removing one of the pioneers. If you remove the final pioneer, that's fine, but you now have lost control of that area or of that polis. So now let's talk about control of these. Whenever you move or whenever you have two or more in a polis and you have plurality, mm -hmm. then you control it. Control means you actually get to move into the city center and we're streaming, so we're probably going to lay these out like so to show, but normally we would just stack these up here, but they're a little hard to see uh, on a top-down camera. However, if somebody then moves in, so let's say, hey, I've taken an action and I come in and I put two there. I don't take control of that. Why? Because I do not uh, supersede the amount that Ken already had there. However, if somehow, some way, I put a third out there, then now these three and he gets punted out and I now control that, okay? But if he had one and I just had one there, well, he maintains control of that. But again, if I have two, I get control of it. When you don't have control, that thing that when he built a city that triggers these doesn't happen. It's only for the player that controls the bolus. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. All right. So now, with all that said, Ent enter entering a, a region that is empty, uh, if you want to take control, you have to have at least two um, pioneers. Yeah. So in other words, like if I, okay, let's say I had these three and I have a movement and I say, hey, I want to go ahead and move over there. I don't take control of that. Control is a minimum of two. Minimum right. of two and plurality. And plurality. Okay. Right. Yep. All right, so place two, place four, place four, easy enough. In fact, this is the only one that places two. All of these place four, okay, that one places three, but hopefully we don't have to use that. All of these here are going to place four pioneers, but the restrictions are a little bit uh, looser. These are where you have a presence already. Mm -hmm. These six do not abide by those rules. These three in the middle here are only on oracle cities, only on temple cities, only on trade cities. You can place four and you can mix and match however you want. So oracle city, oracle city, oracle <coughs> city, oracle, etc. I could put two there, two there, whatever, however you want to mix and match. Okay. 
Obviously, those cost two time, plays four. These plays anywhere. Carte blanche. But it's a lot more expensive. Five, six, and seven, and a time, respectively. So you'll notice it's on any city there. Okay? All right. So that's those are all the available actions that are in this game. So now let me kind of rehash how this works. In a round, whoever has the first player marker is going to take a tile, do an action. Take time as well. Put it up here. Do your stuff. Done. Once your timeline is completely full, you're done for the round. You just hang out. You kibitz with chat. You, you just hang out, right? Heckle. That's fine. Uh, but once all of us are all done and all of our timelines are full, then we move into the reform phase. The reform phase is the reset, but also income. If anybody took the first player marker, they take it. Then all of the time markers. So let's say, for argument's sake, I have some actions. They look, I don't know, uh, that's a bad example. Oh my God. There we go. Just trying to make it look right. There we go. Maybe my board looks something like that, right? So it says, remove singles, doubles turn into singles. So this one turns into a single and the singles go away. Or as I like to do it, that becomes that and these two leave. There, okay? Mm -hmm. So this became that. And also these will go back out onto their respective spots out there on the board. That's what that represents. I tend to put mine all the way to the left. There we go. Then after that, any markers that are on items. Remember over here, we have these. These now come off, mm -hmm. all right? And there are also locations out here on the board which we'll talk about those once we actually get into play, but these can be blocked off as well. Those are a little hard to see, not in person, but they are on camera, so you know what's coming, y'all. We got the votes for women X's that we will use to block them off because it's a little more obvious that they've been used for the mm -hmm. camera. All right. So then after that, then everybody gets their reform phase incomes. All right. So now let's look back at some of these cards. So this is a reform phase income. This says you can turn money into victory points up to five. So that is during the reform phase income step. In addition to that, each city that is on the board, check that, let's rephrase that. Every player gets one city per region and they get to trigger that income again. So in this case, you'll take a look that Ken has, and let's say it's this and this. How about we will do that? Okay. Yeah, that works. So let's say this is Ken's setup at the end of a uh, at the end of a round. He gets to trigger this or this or this. These he just says, "Hey, for the purple region, I'm going to take two points." Mm -hmm. Easy enough or I'm gonna get that. However, if he chooses to trigger this, just like during the, when he built the city, this is the only time you can do it other than when you build the city. In lieu of getting those, he could remove one, provided he controlled it to begin with, and then he will get that income instead. And then we look at the blue area for him, and you can do this in any order that you want. He can, if he, let's say this were here, he could trigger this, or he could trigger the two points by removing one of the pioneers there. And of course he would get to do that in the yellow region. But again, it's only one per player per region. So each player has the potential of three incomes during that income step, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right, so that is the income step right there. Then now, now is when we find out, uh, now is when you get punished for having too many cards. If you have three or less cards, which the majority of the time you will, everything is copesthetic. If you have four or more cards in hand, then you are going to... You, you get an extra time um, next per, card, per card, right? Yeah. So in other words, it clutters your timeline right there. And it's a, it's a single one? 
I think so. I, you know what? I we've never had that we happen. Have worked oh. hard to avoid it. We yeah. have. Okay, so let me let me actually double check that real quick. Do, 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 do. It's a strong enough penalty. Yeah, it's so. yeah to where it just okay. sucks. Like don't do it. Here we go. One hourglass uh, for each civilization card above three. Okay. If you have to take multiple hourglasses, you can. Uh, if you take two, it could be a double or two singles. Yeah. Your choice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Just, right. don't, what, just don't. What do a this. fun choice. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, advance the round marker. Now, one more thing: when you advance the marker from one to two, three to four, and five to six, nothing changes. However, once you advance from two to three, a couple things are going to change. You'll notice that it has that icon, which is, "Hey, remove a blocking." I everyone removes a freebie. Awesome. That's only going to happen twice, which means three are going to stay like luggage, unless you have cards that allow you to do such things like, I don't know, that one. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right. And in addition to that, anytime cards are selected from the tableau, they will then slide and we will refill if there are cards to refill. If there aren't, then there's just less. At the end of round two, we then wipe all of these bad boys and then the Air Epoch or Era 2 ones come out, same thing. And then remember, these are also in the discard, anything that got wiped. So as long as you spend six or eight respectively for one or two, you can go digging and you can freely look through this. There's no shuffling, there's no, just you can do it. And at the beginning of Epoch 3, the level twos or the Epoch twos are available as well. So we go through this, doing all of those things, and then we go into final scoring. So we do that six times. Final scoring is shown here on our player boards. So that is right down here. This says any cards left in hand that you can fulfill, you get to add up the total amount of points. So three plus four, and maybe there are two others, five, six, and then round up half of it. So six divided by two is three, Pretty easy, score three points. If it were five, two and a half round up, you'd score three points for this, as opposed to the six it would have gotten if you'd gotten it out during the game. The exact opposite is the same for any card you can't complete. Add up, divide by two, round up, and score that fewer amount of points, or get lose penalized, that, that, yeah, yeah, lose that amount of points. Yeah. Then, for every cube left over of these here, uh, for every two cubes, uh, score one point, and for every 10 bucks left over, score a point. And finally, and crucially, you go through all of this in round six, meaning you're going to remove hourglasses, twos become ones. However, any hourglasses that are left in your tableau, um, don't go above four, How's that? or above two of them, because then they get to be punitively expensive. The only thing I haven't talked about that I know of are these actions here. These actions are anytime actions when they apply. So the temple ones say, whenever you need to, when you're building a card, you discard a cube from here and it acts as if a virtual plus one. So this isn't at one, because I let's say I need that at two. God, could I pick a different one? <laughs> anyway, let's say I have a card that needs that to be at two. I discard one of these cubes, he's at two. He doesn't move to two, because it's a virtual one. It's a temporary. So, hey, it qualifies. I'll spend a cube. Here you go. Done. So that's for building cards. This one, however, allows you to discard a cube and swap uh, training. So, wow, I really need that second one, but I don't have any here. Okay, I can get one there, but at the cost of somebody else has to go down one. So maybe I choose that one to go down one. Okay, good to go. And I can do that twice if I wish. Um, don't have to, but you may want to. And finally, as a anytime action on your turn, discard any three cubes here to just straight up get a plus one. And that one does move whatever thing you want to train in there. All right. So that's pretty much the entire game of Gentis. I guess I didn't specifically talk about the milestones. The milestones are 18 training. What does that look like? That means these are all smushed together somewhere. That's 18 training. The first one to do it scores eight. Everybody else scores four. This one is have played or built, if you will, eight cards to your tableau. First one's eight, the rest are four. And this is build all six of your cities. You are peace limited. 
if you ever need to move, like build a, a seventh seven city, city, you take a city off and move it to there. And again, eight points and four for everybody else. So whoever has the most points wins at that point. So that is base game epos. Anything I missed? Anything? Any questions no, here? No. All right. Now, ha, portion of what I just taught y'all, forget. Take those <laughs> off. Now, epos has a base game and eight scenarios. One of those scenarios uses this side of the board. That's the one we're doing tonight. That is the training or trading. You know it's the trading one. A, it looks weird. And B, it has a little trade icon. Now you can go ahead and start putting those bad boys out. So let's go ahead and talk about setup, how this differs. First things first, y'all remember that I talked about uh, when you train, right? These are randomly put out here in any order. That is just like in the base game. Normally in the base game, when you train, uh, let's say I'm going to train that one and that one, those would come up, swap places and come up. These don't move. The whole game, they are there forever. That's what those are. So that is change number one. Change number two, you're going to notice that there are trade goods and not costs associated with it as well. Why? Because we also have a cool handy dandy little trade board. That comes in for our game as well. Oh, that was cool. Did you see that? Yeah, How they all kind nice. of rolled together? That was, I'd like to say I planned that, but all right. In addition to the trade board, which I will talk about here in a little bit, uh, all of the cities, instead of getting money, they're going to get you resources. Now, there are a couple of exceptions uh, of those cities, and I think it's actually shown up pretty well on that one. So here, did I? Oh, I did. Hold on. Let's try that. There we go. So there is one temple city and there is one oracle city. Outside of that, every other city within the center section gives two resources. There are four types of resources in this game. I'm going to run this through for everybody present. Incense, glass, what is that? Metal and cloth. Incense, yeah. glass, metal, and cloth? Yeah, it's the only time you're going to hear obviously, a Ken say those that, words. That's obviously I what they are. I hate you so much. I hate you. <laughs> uh, so, whenever, for your income, and whenever you build cities, you're going to take two of whatever it is, obviously, right? However, you'll notice up here in the hinterlands, or in the provinces, you only get a single, because, you know, I guess it's harder out there. Resources. Plus you get the uh, there, and that is the only money city right there. Yep. All right, so now let's talk about how trading works. Everybody is going to start. There are obviously supplies of resources as well. All right, so let's see, there we go. Everyone's going to start with one resource. And in the base game, you start with 20 bucks. In the trade scenario, you start with 10 bucks, which is about half as good, give or take. So let's go through how the actions work. I'm not gonna have to reteach all the actions, don't worry, but there are some significant, meaningful changes. These tiles, remember, it was the amount of money that you spend is the tile that you take. Mm -hmm. This one is a little bit different. You are not spending cash, you are spending resources. The resources are those two. So if I want to train for the army here, it requires one glass and one incense. So that is two goods. So if I'm going to train two people, so divide these numbers in half, and that's how many trainings you're going to be taking. That's, that's it. You always have to take the number closest to the amount of trainings you're doing. So if I'm taking two trainings, or if I'm doing two, that means I'm taking the four because that's four resources. If it's Each of the if it's available. If it's not available, you take the six, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. right? But you are capped at two to four trainings, respectively. Yeah. Except there are some exception cities. So the exception cities look like this. They have a plus one training, meaning you get to do a free training. Just like in the base game, it's free. You don't have to pay the resources, but it can only be one of the ones that you already trained. Yeah. Okay. 
So that's how those differ. First player doesn't differ at all, okay? I'm gonna skip this and come back to it here in a moment. Then these bad boys are somewhat similar. Uh, the same, right? Yeah, the, the navigation or navigator are the same. And these the, are the same. Uh, yes, and the orange ones, the building of the cards are the same. The gaining of the, or the acquiring of the cards are can be the same. You pay cash, just like in the base game, if you want, for the tiles. Again, however much you spend, that's the tile you need to take. Uh, you always must take or spend the full amount, even if you're not taking cards far enough along or the amount of cards or whatnot. You, this is the minimum amount you're taking or you're spending, unless you have one of these cities that says, hey, you can actually spend the exact amount, ignoring the amount on the tile. So a little bit of flexibility, but that would need a votes for women X to use. However, in lieu of spending cash, you may spend resources. There are four different types of resources. This says if you only want to take the first or second card and spend quote unquote two bucks value, you can spend any one resource. However, if you want the four level, you must spend two of the same resource. What resource? Your choice, but a pair of the same resource. Trips of a resource, two pair, and it cannot be two incense and two incense. I tried that and I got overruled. Yep. So it's two incense and two cloth or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or a full house of resources, so three metal and two incense. And then you either pay fully in cash or fully in resources. If you don't have the resources, you gotta pay in cash. Okay, so we're talking about the trade, uh, you know, the 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 uh, trade resources. But now let's talk about this board and how this affects the actual trading. The game starts with each resource having a value of two. Every player's turn works just like it did in the base game. You take one action. Take it, get time, the whole nine yards. However, before or after your action, you may take a single trade action. You are not required to. It is totally up to you. But before, so trade action, action, done. Or action, trade action, done. Your choice. A trade action, you're going to trade in some amount of goods to get either some amount of goods, five bucks, or a temple cube, or an oracle cube. Those are your two op or your four options. At the beginning of the game, you can turn in two incense for two metal, two cloth for two glass. You get the idea. However, this is going to manipulate, and eventually it might look something along the lines of that. When it does, now, when you take a trade action, you can turn in one incense for four metal. You can turn in four metal for two glass, et cetera, et cetera. These are, whether it coming or going, that's what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Okay? You can take one of those. So, one incense for five bucks. Cool. All right, mm -hmm. great. However, whenever you take a trade action out here, before or after your turn, all, almost always, the resources are going to go onto the uh, the track out here, if you will. The game starts with one of every one. It does not matter the order of them. It, quite literally, in fact, I'm going to do it like this, just because that coincides with the resources to keep it easier for organization. The order and the placement doesn't matter. In a four-player game, there are 16 spaces. These are here because those are overflow. To me, this makes it a little confusing, so I thought I would make it a little clearer for you out, out there. So on your turn, let's say, hey, Sarah says, hey, for my action, I'm gonna take four metal, and I'm gonna go ahead and get five bucks, something like that. It, if you take any of the lower three actions, all of the resources that you paid to take that action go out here on the board like so. However, if you trade goods for goods, so instead with these four, and again, it doesn't matter which four, it's the four metal though. Uh, Sarah, instead of doing that said, wow, it kind of sucks spending four of it, but you know what? I'm desperate for one incense. 
Okay, in that case, instead of all four going on, only one. If you trade goods for goods, only one go, the rest go into the supply, and then from the supply, she gets whatever it is she traded for, be it one incense, three cloth, whatever, and that would go into her supply like so. So, one resource if you're doing this, goods for goods, all the resources if doing anything else. In addition to that, remember up there in the training, you're spending resources, all of those goods come out here onto there. So you can see eight spots. If you train four times, eight of them, boom, they all get full. So let's say it is something, just give me a bunch, whatever. Okay, we got that and good, that's enough. There, and in fact, okay, there, fine. Uh, let's do it like this and there. So at the end of Shrey's turn, maybe he trained, maybe he did at the end of his turn, meaning after he has done trading, if he chose to do a trade out here, and he's done with his action. He's done, and now there's at least 16 or more. It could be something along the lines of all of that, okay? With four players. With four players, right. That's all I'm talking about. What happens then is you pull one resource off of each kind. So one, one one and one. Now, are there still 16 or more? This is kind of reminiscent of Weimar in a sense. Mm -hmm. Let's say it's actually that after we've pulled all those off. Well, now we do it all again. So we take one from each off. There, there. Now, are there at least 16 in there? The answer is no. So therefore, now we stop removing. But now what we do is we adjust the market dynamically for this. So we look at incense. There are four. Oh, there we go. Uh, there are four incense. So incense is going to drop one. By the way, you are capped at the ends. It can't go it, uh, more higher or lower on that. There is no cloth. No cloth says one, two, three. Okay, cool. Glass, there are two left. That will go up. And there are a ton here, so it's going to crater and that goes down all the way, like so. Uh, then, once you've done all of that, all of these will get removed, back to the supply, and then it's the next player's turn. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, now that I've talked about how the market works, I've talked about these actions, so that now it makes more sense on the uh, the purchasing of cards with resources. The one that I have not talked about now, however, is the tax collector. Similar to the base game, but drastically different. This one says, it costs one time, you get two different goods. It could be a glass and a metal, whatever. Choose two. Okay. Then you get to do two trades. So remember at the beginning, I said you get to do a trade and then an action or an action and then a trade. In this case, you're gonna do both your trades afterwards because you're always going to gain the free resources first. Then you get to do two trades. They could be for resources, for any of these things. This is the exact same iconography as is on the trade board, except it has a little two times because you get to do it twice. You don't have to, but you may. So that is that action. So, again, similar, but different. Mm -hmm. Everything else pretty much works the same, except for these. There are five trade cards. The number is F1 through F5, right down here in the corner, you can see. And they also have the trade icon up here in the top left-hand corner. These replace five of these cards. It's specified in the rules. I forget which one, doesn't matter. You replace five of them, these get shuffled in. Because at the end of the game, these are going to have a special impact on trading. In addition, they also have to do with trade goods, as you can see here. This says during the uh, reform phase, you get two different resources, as if you took the tax collector mm -hmm. action. However, you don't get to do the additional Extra trades. Right. Yeah. So there you go. That is those. So now, the only thing I need to talk about now is how Endgame works. Endgame works the exact same, except you are allowed to do trades 
based on one for every city that you have built out here on the board. In addition, you can do one trade based on how many of those uh, Epoch 1 trade cards, the five special ones I just showed y'all. If you have two of those and you have three cities, you get to take do five trade actions before you know resolving any cards and, and being able to get any bonus points. Works the exact same otherwise. Whoever has the most points wins. Any questions? No. That was a lot. That was a lot. I'm really glad y'all made it this far. Thanks. Appreciate it. While you're here, like, subscribe. Consider supporting the show. Patreon really, really does help. And I'm a drop of piece of knowledge. Did you know that you do not have to have a parachute to go skydiving? Probably do need one if you want to go skydiving. Twice, however. The more you know.